Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Tory Story. Today we have amazing, an amazing guest. His name is Matthew Khalil, and he is a screenwriter and a lecturer in screenwriting at the Maharishi University of Management in Iowa. And he's joining us today to talk all about screenwriting news. This is this show is particularly speaking to new screenwriters who kind of just don't have a clue <laughs> and are just starting out and trying to get their scripts out there. They they have a desire and a passion and a talent. And they're trying to get their script out there and um, I'm just not entirely sure how to go about it if, you know, if anyone uh, like, <laughs> yeah, and exactly. um, yeah. <laughs> I, I suppose, yeah, from my perspective, I'm just, you know, uh, I'm a former journalist. I was, um, a news journalist. Well, I worked in a newsroom uh, as a sub editor and uh, writer for mm -hmm. um, a news station in Johannesburg. And it was, you know, it was that's where I learned how to write in that style. And, um, but I've always been a screenwriter. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I knew in, in my heart that was what I wanted to do always. And I was just like, that's a crazy idea. You know, I don't, I don't know if yeah. I can actually ever do that. Like, it was sort of like, it felt like it was a pie in the sky dream, mm -hmm. like a a bit of a feather brain idea. Like, that's never going to happen for me. And then just the one day I was like, you know what? I can't deal with life anymore without living my dreams. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Um, I'm sure you can relate. Mm, um, absolutely. And anyway, so um, I... Um, but this is very much going into my story, but I'm going to let you chat a while and actually yeah. talk about your story, which is super interesting. Oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's you, funny. How did you become a screenwriter? Go. Oh my gosh, that's also a great question. I think um, yeah. I just remember when I was about 12 or 13 and it was careers mm -hmm. day at school and they had to kind of help me choose which subjects to do. And I went into the headmaster's office and said, I want to be a film director. And they said, mm -hmm. I never, the, the headmaster was like, well, you can't in this country. <laughs> this was a long time ago in South Africa. He was like, it's, but it's bitch. such a, it's very much a South African mindset. Hey, people will just yeah, tell you, you know, that's not for you. We're out here yeah. in South Africa, down in the South, like way far away from Hollywood. Like, yeah. no, no, that's, you, you've got to think about something else. <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. And I went back home and I like yeah. looked at the map of South Africa and I was like, well, there's lots of game farms. So I'll be a game ranger because I like animals. And then they were like, much better, do geography. That's it. End of the dream. Mm -hmm. No more opportunities. And yeah. uh, that stayed with me, um, that, that whole yeah. um, experience. But one of the sh first short films I ever made, I shot in that headmaster's office, <laughs> which was great. Mm -hmm. I felt this was many years later. <laughs> so I had my little, my gosh. Like, um, I, it was a nice moment in my life actually to, to get access to his office. He was long left the uh, school, but um, it yeah. was really funny that, you know, I managed to at least make a short. Um, I made many, many shorts, but I did that and shot in his office. So that was a discussion about being a film director. So it yeah. was a real, down moment and actually I go there a lot as a I think psychologically I go there a lot even as a, yeah. as a very formative moment so and I have moments mm -hmm. of self-doubt and questions of can I do this am I good mm -hmm. enough I, I think that moment stays with you you know um so Definitely. it's really important to to have encouragement I think and to be encouraged to kind of um do these things and actually working in America I see the way they work here they just follow their dreams no matter what they're just like I want to do this thing and they yeah. go and do it they don't ask they for do permission it. they don't ask for it they just do it and mm -hmm. um, I think that's why the the culture of filmmaking has been so influenced by America at least you know a lot mm. of the stuff that we watch is from here obviously yeah. they have the resources because they're a massive country that goes to wars with other countries <laughs> but yeah. besides that yeah. they they yeah. also have um this, uh, this thing of just I want to do it and then they just do it whereas I think in South Africa we often ask for permission to do things um so yeah. that stays with me I think as a you know you're talking earlier about um what's the obstacle for you to get your script into reality yeah. and one of the things is this feeling of needing permission like i need a producer i need a money i need all of these like i need to get asked for permission i think it's a very south african thing to like you know excuse me Definitely. sir do you mind if i make this movie <laughs> whereas yeah, in america it's like i'm gonna make this movie yeah <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely it's, it's interesting so anyway that was my early 
um, sort of calling to be a screenwriter or, or director. And then um, eventually after being many, many things, uh, mm -hmm. being very lost and confused and going to the army in those days, I went to the army for a year, I'm that old. Uh, mm -hmm. I then went to, you know, I was like, I had a little coffee shop that I was running, then I was like delivering aluminium for a company, uh, driving around delivering aluminium. Then I was uh, working as a sales rep for a photographic company, driving around again, being a sales rep, selling batteries. Yeah. And then <laughs> eventually I went to London and worked in London and also drove around delivering sandwiches in London. And then I came back to South Africa and I wanted to study something and I ended up at UCT doing a degree majoring in English and environmental and geographical science, which is a little bit like Game Ranger film director still still going on, <laughs> even in those yeah. days. Um, yeah. Anyway, and then I wrote a script or two or three and entered it into a, a national script writing competition and was a finalist. And then I was like, hmm, maybe I can do this. And then um, I attended a workshop that this um, film school called the Northern Film School in Leeds in the UK was giving. And I really liked what they did and I applied to their program. And the next thing I knew, I got my master's in screenwriting in the UK and then came back to South Africa and started writing for television. So that's my, in a nutshell, I suppose, my trajectory. Yeah. That's so interesting. So, what, so it basically you started with a competition. You entered the competition, you won and you were yeah. like, yes, this is it. Yeah. Um, this yeah. is my life. Yeah. That's so great. Um, yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably like one of the things that really tells you, like, I need, I must, I'm, I'm going to pursue this. If other people think I'm great, <laughs> great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. That's awesome. Um, and it was also interesting that uh, just in terms of like yeah. bizarre stories, uh, that competition when I got to the final of it, um, we all were flown up to Johannesburg and we went to a game farm and had this like writer's workshop thing. And as we arrived there, there was this big table and we all sat down at the table and there was a book on the table and it was um, The Writer's Journey, which is Christopher Vogler wrote this book called The Writer's Journey, which is very influential. And yeah. it was sitting on the desk and I'll never forget the moment for some reason I, I saw this book and I was like, what is this book? And I read it and I was really influenced, influenced by it. Um, yeah. And cut to like many years later, I'm in Los Angeles meeting with Christopher Vogler, having lunch with him. Mm. <laughs> and the next thing I know, um, he's written the foreword for my book. And it was just so, you know, it's so weird how far you feel from it at some point. And then the next thing you're in it and you're like, wow. Yeah. Oh my God, this is Chris Vogler. This uh, is so weird. The Three Worlds of Screenwriting, uh, that came out in 2020, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, and I think so maybe just before yeah <laughs> um and i mean obviously you can download it everywhere online just letting everybody know i'll put a link um in the description to the book uh, but cool. yeah i've um some really really interesting things that you say in the book do you want to maybe touch on like um how screenwriters try to get things perfect like how mm -hmm. they worry so much about getting it right um mm -hmm. and what's more important getting it right or finishing it hmm. definitely finishing it um mm -hmm. i think uh 100 finishing it definitely yeah um there is something to be said about getting it right though um because yeah. You know, okay, so this is interesting and it may go a little bit against, you know, uh, you can just do it. But um, there is this thing where people watch movies and think they can write scripts because they've watched lots of movies and they love movies. Right. But I always say it's like going to a classical concert and watching a whole orchestra play and hearing the piece of music and loving the piece of music and like knowing even, yeah. oh, this is like, you know, in, in, in experimental musical. This is, and like having some knowledge about music and then writing a musical score, going home and just yeah. writing a score. Like you can't do that. You have to learn how notation works. You have to know what you're writing on the page. Yeah. And it's like an architect as well. Like if you go to a building and you love buildings, oh, this is Art Nouveau and I love the feeling of, I'm gonna go home and design a building. And then they go home and design a building. And it's not the same as, it's the same as screenwriting. You can't just watch a movie and go and write a script. It doesn't work like that, sadly. There is a, there's a language that you have to learn. 
And so it's very easy though. You just read lots of scripts. It's that, that simple. Right. And if you read lots of screenplays, you can write. Like I always say to my students and anyone thinking about studying, right, screenplay writing, I'm like, yeah. if you read 20 feature film scripts, mm. you never have to come to, you never have to study screenwriting. Wow. Definitely not. Just read wow, 20 screenwriting. Just read 20 feature film scripts. If you do that, I can't teach you anything because you've, you've learned it all. And, wow. you know, that's it actually. But but it's so, There's people don't read screenplays. Yeah, but it really is that simple. Just awesome do that. Because I think people make it out to be so much more complicated than it really is. And really, if it was that much more complicated, like you'd have to be a rocket scientist to write. <laughs> You know, it's not really it's that funny that you, well, well, it's funny that you said it because there is the saying, and I use it sometimes, which is screen yeah. screenwriting isn't rocket science. It's more difficult. <laughs> so there is that. There is that. There is weird it's that you say rocket that, science. That's true because, because it's it so important to get it right because there's no like, it's like putting an astronaut in space. You can't hope that he gets there. Like he's got to actually get there and back and survive and yeah, be really yeah. successful in the trip. And there are a lot yeah. of things that go into this and you've got to actually yeah. do all those things. Is that, is that what? It, that, that's pretty yeah. much it. And I think it's, you know, I love the way that you say you've got to get an astronaut in a thing and there and back. It's like a story structure. It's like, you got to get your character in the thing. You got them out there and then you got to get them back. <laughs> it's like, okay. it's, it's, it's literally like a little story. And um, yeah. I think you can, people get a lot, a lot caught up on story structure and, have you got all the right beats in your story? And does this happen on this page? That I disagree with 100%. Like the obsession around a particular kind of story that works, that has a particular DNA that is that all stories have. And you, a lot of the screenwriting books you'll, you'll read, if you read them, are all about this. Like there's only one way of telling a story and I know what it is. Give me your money and I'll tell you, <laughs> right? That is bullshit. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, cool. it's not like that. Each story has its own internal DNA and it has its mm -hmm. own internal logic and it has its own uh, way of being told and its own tone and its own everything. Um, mm -hmm. However, the words on the page is the thing that's really interesting um, is that the, if you want to get obsessed about anything and you want to, it, it's the words on the page because that, that's literally all you have yeah. is you have like little text on a white page in which to activate the readers, the camera in the reader's brain to be able to see yeah. what you are writing on the page. And if you can get that right, um, that's where you should use the rocket science-ness of it. Because you're, you're not just mm -hmm. writing to your friends, you're actually writing to cinematographers, editors, production designers, um, actors, directors, all these people you're writing to in this document. And so that skill, and that's why I think it's a craft screenwriting. Um, it's a craft in that um, you have to do it again and again to get better at it. And it's also why we don't have any that I can think of screenwriting prodigies, you know, like 12 year olds that write amazing screenplays or <laughs> that get made yeah. into feature films because it's a craft, yeah. just like um, yeah. anything like pottery. You don't get amazing like pottery, young pottery makers. You have to just keep doing it, keep doing it. and keep reading scripts would be my main thing. We were talking about Rocky earlier and how Sylvester Stallone, I mean, you can maybe jump on that story because it's an interesting one yeah. and how he got into screenwriting. I thought it was so interesting because, I mean, so he was, I don't know if anybody's watched the documentary on Netflix. I just, I watched that documentary and the way he described it was that he'd never written before. Um, he was a, um, he was an actor, um, like, he was always cast in these thug roles and, um, you know, he was trying to break out of that. And he thought, well, the only way to do that is to actually write the script, the script that I believe would be right for the character that I want to play because nobody was writing scripts like that. And um, so he literally created, which I love, it's like he created the, the niche for himself. Um, yeah. And he, yeah, he said he watched Rocky and he wrote Rocky in three days. Like he, he lived in this awful apartment and um, he painted the windows black so that he wouldn't get distracted. And he <laughs> literally just sat in there and forced himself to write this, um, this script, which he said most of it was like, it wasn't perfect. He was, he admitted he wasn't, it wasn't, mm. he, I think he said it wasn't like, it wasn't ready. <laughs> but 
he finished it and he just sort of, I think the story goes of like, he had, um, he was sort of taking it to producers and saying, I don't need a huge budget. I only need like, I think it was like, it was like under a million dollars or something like that budget to make this movie. And it was basically made with like such a low budget. Wow. And then um, it became like the highest grossing movie at the time. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's a crazy story, right? It's, yeah, it's amazing. It's not. It's almost like that's miraculous. <laughs> well, I think um, it is, but it's also you know it's also hard work that he put in, and I think it's also the fact that he was an actor meant that he'd read scripts. So I'm gonna go back to my original thing. Is I bet you Sylvester Stallone had read at least. 10 feature film scripts, maybe more if he was an actor, maybe he was casting for them. And he was in that Hollywood um, was kind of stream. Him. And and the yeah. thing is that if you're in that scene, you read scripts all the time. Like if any movie you watch, the writer of that movie has read many, many scripts. So I'm just gonna say yeah. it again, read scripts. I know yeah. it's not easy and it, it's not, but like that's, I bet you he had read a lot of scripts because I've read the original Rocky screenplay. And it's worth reading, by the way. It's all, it's all online. You can get it very easily. Um, and there's lots of scripts online. In the old days, it was difficult to get scripts, actually. Screenwriters in the past used to have like a sort of underground thing where they would like share scripts with each other and stuff. Nowadays, it's all online. You yeah. just Google Rocky oh. Screenplay, you'll get it. It's yeah. interesting, actually, looking at the Rocky Screenplay and looking at the movie yeah. and seeing the differences between the two. And you see what Sylvester Stallone had written and what ended up on the screen. And mm. there is a lot of... A lot of it ended up on the screen, but there's also a few things that you're like, ooh, okay, yeah, I can see why they had to take that out. <laughs> it's so so again, it goes back to your thing. It wasn't perfect, but it was a thing in the world. And it's important to have that. It's so important to get that first script out yeah. with an ending. You actually spoke about this as well as like Rocky Sylvester Stallone could see the ending. He knew how it ended, and he was like, Okay, if you can see the yeah. ending. Um mm. And the ending of Rocky is kind of interesting because the, the last shot in Rocky is him and Adrian kissing. Um, mm-hmm. And it's a love story. Rocky's actually a love story more yeah. than a boxing story. And that's the, okay. the funny thing about it. But I think he could see that ending. And so the, he wrote mm-hmm. it. And yeah. And then, of course, there was the thing that he had to try and sell it. And he was selling it, but he was going to be the lead. So he was insisting on that. And he had the power because he'd written it to, to say, I'm the lead. I think a lot of people right. were wanting to make it with someone else as the lead. And he was like, nope, I have the power mm-hmm. here because I'm the writer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then like, you're yeah. not going to push me out of my own movie. Yeah, like, exactly. And me? then, yeah. 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 So, yeah, yeah, it's an interesting uh, story about, I guess, um, just making it happen. It is interesting. Yeah. A lot of it was really personal for him as well. I think he drew a lot from yep. his the story of his dad. Um, Absolutely. He was a horrible person. Oh, sorry. Um, I apologize to Celeste Lone's dad, but apparently he, well, I mean, you know, there was video footage of it in the, oh, in really? the documentary of oh, doing gosh. awful things. Um, wow. Got to watch this. <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble for this. You won't. But anyway, um, uh, so, so, so Rocky was, yeah, it was at the, apparently at the time, everyone was making anti-hero movies. It was all very, um, I don't know, according to, to mm-hmm. Sylvester, it was like, uh, anti-everything basically. And yeah. he was like, let's bring back the hero vibe, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, so he said, that's why it was this sort of gap in the industry at the time and he just took that gap um yeah. and i mean that's interesting right how do writers pinpoint what is needed in the industry at that time <laughs> well <laughs> it's a great question again um you know there's this william goldman uh, who wrote adventures in the screen trade um he said nobody knows anything <laughs> that was his summary of like trying to predict what the trends are he was like nobody knows anything people think they know and they claim they know so what's interesting about that thing with rocky is you mentioned something there about him drawing from his personal experience Mm -hmm. and i think that's where the strength lies more than trying to predict the latest trend or whatever i think um drawing from your personal experience and putting something of yourself on the page and not being afraid Mm -hmm. to draw from 
your memories or from something that is personal to you. I'm not saying write your life story at all because it's probably not as exciting as, <laughs> as something that you know has someone fighting the heavyweight champion of the world, but draw from your experience and put it in a screenplay. Yeah. And yeah. I can guarantee you 100% that if you do that, it's going to feel fresh and it's going to feel like a new voice yeah. because no one else has had your personal experiences. Uh, so that's the one thing. And then the other thing is predicting trends is, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it really is, a I, I feel, it's a losing game because um, the scripts that are in production now that we're seeing on the screen have been in production for like 10, eight years at least, probably six to eight years. Um, until your average screenplay, by the way, and this takes that long to get made. So I think yeah. if you Google average length of screenplay yeah. getting into production, it's I going to be about eight. That. That's incredible. Yeah, about eight years, six to eight years, I think. Um, okay. And so what's happening now is like there's other scripts that are doing the rounds. So, actually, if you want to see what's trendy, you could, um, there's a thing called the Blacklist, which is a competition that happens every year where um, mm -hmm. screenwriters send in their uh, scripts. And the Blacklist every year it does like the top 10. They actually do top 100, I think, or top 50 scripts. Uh, hmm. that are doing the rounds in Hollywood, basically. And that's and now where a lot of studios get their ideas from, actually, is the Blacklist uh, competition. Right. So it's one way of getting your script noticed. But also, if you really want to do your homework, read scripts on the Blacklist to know what's coming up and what kind of issues are being dealt with now, which are going to be on the screen in like six years or five years. Oh, that's I'm excluding the Marvel very... Cinematic Universe in this. <laughs> Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I'll put that in the description as well. Excellent. Yeah. Cool. Um, so you were saying, yes, drawing on personal experience. Um, I think, you know, as a writer, I know that that is probably one of the most difficult things to do, um, especially because if there's certain things that you're uncomfortable going back there, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's probably something that every writer just completely wants to avoid at all costs right um do you feel that way when you're writing scripts um for sure yeah um <laughs> it's interesting that you say that like, because I um this. i don't want to do this it's like awful therapy it's like you know facing your demons or whatever and like yeah, having a horrible yeah. trip down mary mary lane yeah. you know it's um ernest hemingway said writing's easy all you do is sit in front of a typewriter and bleed and <laughs> you know it's oh, it's yeah. interesting and somebody else who i can't remember right now was talking maybe it was stanislavski but i don't think so was talking about taking a pound of flesh and putting it on the stage as an actor you take a pound of flesh of your flesh and you put it on the stage and that's how you perform meaningful roles and um in my book the three wells of screenwriting i actually talk about these like three things you can access when writing the one is mm -hmm. um external sources like other movies you've seen the other thing is your imagination you like make it up and then the third thing is the where you dig in deep with your own senses and experiences and draw from that now for me the memory well is quite scary and i think for a lot of writers it is scary like you've been describing but for some writers it's easy. that's all they write about they just write i want to write about my life and then they write about their life super easy <laughs> I'm like that's not me i'm like I'll go to the imagination well and like make stuff up and like, you know, half a Oh, that's my movie. favorite. Oh, imagination. I'll just make stuff up that's nothing like my life. <laughs> well, okay, uh, but maybe uh, a little that I wish my life was like. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is that <laughs> I do know, I know for sure from having taught screenwriting for like 24 years and read so many scripts mm -hmm. for, my, for my sons. Um, that when people put in that little thing that's from their life, I actually do an exercise with my students where um, I do a thing called uh, memory writing and they write, they find a scene in their life, like an important moment. And they write like wow. a three page thing about that moment. Every time we share that in class, people cry, people laugh, the room changes, something in the air changes because mm -hmm. something is resonating in you when you're writing it, you're, you're, you're moving, you're vibrating with energy of some kind, you put it on the page, wow. it translates onto the screen when people read it, it translates. And I so- feel like I can feel it right now. That's like, I'm literally yeah. feeling all the emotions, That's it. but I can imagine people putting on the page. So yeah. if you do that, it's so powerful. And, and I always say like, um, 
my example that I use is like, if, if you have to write a superhero movie and now you have to write a funeral scene mm -hmm. and you, it's a graveyard and, and say a superhero has died, like in the Superman movie, <laughs> Superman died once <laughs> in one of the yeah. versions of Superman. And now you have to write the funeral scene. Now it's a totally imagined thing. But if you just write an imagined funeral, like if you write a Batman funeral, it's super easy. Everyone's wearing black, there's umbrellas, there's rain, there's, you know, you can see the whole thing. But if you think about your life and you think, where, what funerals have I been to that have moved me or what graveyards have I seen that have moved me? And you find an element in that. So, for example, um, I'm just thinking of like going to Africa Burn. There's this graveyard on the way and <laughs> there's this like hard Karoo sand and like you can't dig into it with a shovel right and i'm imagining a funeral scene now where my superhero is being buried back in his hometown but he comes from like a small Karoo town for some reason and they're trying to like dig into the ground and everyone's sweating and it's like changes the whole feeling and you you use those few images and few moments in your work it's going to give it a, a freshness that no one else has done. So that's yeah. what I mean by memory writing. I'm not talking about going necessarily to the traumatic spaces. Interestingly yeah. enough, this yeah. place that I teach at, yeah. it doesn't have to be. And if it is, I would I would avoid it to a certain extent um, because it's yeah. going to create blockages for you. Um, yeah. Weirdly enough, this well, not weirdly enough, but the school that I'm teaching at at the moment, the David Lynch MFA in screenwriting, is at this place called the Maharishi University and it's a bit of a strange place but one of the things they do is they meditate they've got this meditation technique and the this thing here is meditate and create and David Lynch does talk about he does daily meditations every day twice a day and I do think that a that a healthy thing that you do that keeps you safe um, it yeah. can be meditation. It could be going to the gym. It could be swimming. It could be yeah. therapy. It could be whatever it is. As if you are in that space where you can create, you don't necessarily have to go through the trauma of creation. But also, some people do. I mean, you know, some of the greatest writers of all time are very traumatized, troubled people. <laughs> it's just sometimes that's the case. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think having a, um, you also have to live and function in the real world, you know, uh, I think. So So having a balance of some kind is important. If you're going to go into that well and that space, there is power there. Yeah. I'm telling you because you're scared to go there. <laughs> There's power in that space you're afraid to go to. There really is. Yeah. It's like go to the fear and face the fear and write that. That's what Rocky did. I mean, that's so bad. Really, really, um, I, love, I love what you said. But um, thank goodness that we don't have to go into some deep, dark place <laughs> no. to write um, things that are, it's actually probably, as you said, it's not, it's not ideal because that, that could end up, you put you in writer's block. Yeah, um, absolutely. But I love what you say about the meditation and, and, and mm. so sort of bringing into, uh, bringing in your your vision of what you want to see in mm. the script and what you're sort of you're visualizing to to actually bring that into reality yeah yeah, yeah. cool yeah. um so hmm, 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 hmm. okay so how much of becoming <laughs> how much of becoming a great screenwriter is about getting a big opportunity to showcase your work or finding someone who really believes in you mm. I think it's probably, sadly, a very big part of it. <laughs> um, almost a hundred percent. This is the weird. One of the weird things about screenwriting is that um, a script is not the final product. So, um, if you write a novel, you can just give it to people to read. If you have a script, you could give it to people to read, but it's not the final product. So, screen screenwriting is the beginning of a bigger process that involves a lot of people, like. Of, you know, a lot of people and a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So finding that person that believes in you um, or making that connection is sadly very much an important part of the process. And it's tricky because even in my life, I have got a script that I love um, more than one, but I've got one in particular that I need to find the right person. And I've just, I've just written an adaptation of a novel um, it's like a famous South African novel. I love it. I, wow. it, I've always wanted to make it. Um, and I, I, I just took it on my own to just write the script because I was just getting frustrated. I needed to do something creative. So I did this adaptation 
I've literally got it sitting mm -hmm. on my laptop and now I need to get it to people. And so it's finding the right producer or partner that you can work with. And it's tricky yeah. because, um, you know, the good thing about South Africa is it's a very small pond. <laughs> it's easy to find. Like you can literally Google, uh, you watch a movie that you like and you see who the producer is and Google that person and send them an email and say, I've got the script I'd love you to read. In South Africa, yeah. it's so much easier to make those first steps. Yeah. Because people in South Africa will read unsolicited material, whereas in America they won't. Um, okay. There's no way you'll get your script to produce it. But why is that? Um, is it just because it's a smaller industry here. Yeah, I think it's it's a smaller industry, and um, everybody. I feel like maybe it's because I've been done quite a lot in the South African film industry. But I feel like everybody knows everybody. If you go to an event, you know, uh, if you go to um, so CakeNet has that event every year. What's it called? The, uh fierce whatever it's called uh i forget what it's called but um if you go to that festival um mm -hmm. where they show their movies and things you'll hang out with directors and producers and they'll just be there you know um, if you go to yeah. the um, durban film mart there'll be people there and you'll meet people it's quite easy in south africa to to meet like top filmmakers in south africa but it's important to do that um just in terms of my trajectory i can tell you how i got my first scripts made was yeah. early on in South Africa, there was a, um, a thing called the Script Writers, what SASWA? South African Script Writers Association, SASWA. Okay. They don't exist anymore. <laughs> they turned into the Writers Guild of South Africa, WGSA. Um, okay. But I, I went to a meeting, one of these SASWA okay. meetings, and it was pretty much like some wannabe screenwriters hanging around, having cups of tea and talking to each other about their work. But there was also yeah. in that there were some established writers who were there as well. Yeah. And I met yeah. these two writers, uh, Vicky Borkham and Adrian Galley, who are amazing people. And they were yeah. like, oh, you've just come back from the UK and you've got your MA in screenwriting. You should contact Roberta Durant from Penguin Films. And, you know, we're doing the script. You should, you should contact her. There's a new series happening. And I literally Googled her name and phoned up Penguin Films out of the blue and just said, hi, could I speak to Roberta Durant, who's this like big producer? And they were like, sure. And they put me through and I was like, hi, Roberta, I've just come back from the US, from the UK and I've got an MA in screenwriting. I'd like to write. And she says, oh, we've got the yeah. show happening. Send me some samples of your work. And then through that process, yeah. eventually I ended up uh, writing for SOS um, for many years. Nice. And nice. so it's about making that. Gold. Yeah, amazing. it's about making that personal connection. It really is. Yeah. Um, you you yeah. can't just sit on your script. Uh, it's never going to yeah. go anywhere. Yeah, it, it's so true. I mean, that's what I've heard from other people as well. And I think just in life and gender, that was actually pretty much the answer. Like, write it and go and find the people. You know, go and put yourself out there in front of the people and, and get to know people. Um, and then another thing that I thought was like super interesting is how this um, how this podcast how how it happened because um, I know this is very this is kind of people are gonna go like this is super woo. Um, <laughs> this yeah. is just funny to me because I was thinking for a couple of weeks about how, um, I wanted to interview a screenwriter and I wanted to get tips from her and learn out learn how like this whole industry works. And, um, I had no idea who, and it was just really funny because, um, and then you direct messaged me, <laughs> um, and I was like, oh, amazing. It just fell out of the yeah. sky. Um, and then you know, I was looking at the so the David Lynch MFA in screenwriting is actually at um, the Maharishi University of Management, right? Um, yeah, it changed its name to the Maharishi International University. Much better. I see. Maharishi International <laughs> University, right. Yeah. And and first I was like, awesome, David Lynch, like that's, you know, the director of um, Twin Peaks, which was like the most popular cult classic. Mm. Um, and... And then sort of, sort of was Googling a bit and then found out that Jim Carrey made that famous speech. So it's like one of the most popular videos on YouTube. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and he's, I think that was brilliant that they actually had Jim yeah. Carrey speaking. And yeah. I, I thought that was so clever because he's so into that stuff that he knows he seems really, really a bit nuts. But <laughs> <laughs> that's what was so brilliant about it because, um, <laughs> You know, he wrote like this. So, you know, the story, how the story goes. He wrote himself a check 
for like I think it's like ten million dollars or something. Mm-hmm. And then he like put it in his pocket or he put it in his wallet and and then I think it was like five years later, I think he got Wow his dumb and dumber. Um, Amazing. And I don't know if they paid him a full ten million for that. I think it was like five million or something like that. But he wow. definitely has ten million now. <laughs> um, oh yeah. <laughs> and so how much of this has like has to come across in your in your in your teaching at David Lynch? Do they sort of bring this into the David Lynch MFA uh, in screenwriting? So the most the, the main thing that so David Lynch basically gave his name to the program and he he zooms in like twice a year and talks to the students. Um, so the thing that comes in is not so much like you know manifestation or um you know using the secret to manifest your things it's just meditation it's just like the only thing that comes in is learning what they call transcendental meditation which is a kind of meditation just like any other and um that is the thing that the students are taught before they come here so they actually learn how to meditate and you don't have to um do it but it's it's a tool um that that some students tend to use and david does it all the time and anytime you ask david a question about like how do you make opportunities in the industry he's like well you should meditate twice a day and he kind of he's like really focused on like getting into the flow of some kind and i think actually what you're talking about here is in some ways how do we it sometimes seems a bit mysterious and magical how opportunities happen and um something like writing a check to yourself for 10 million dollars and having it there as a constant thing or having a vision board you know my wife just made mm. some vision boards for herself which is yeah you know having vision boards or having um like uh i don't know uh or meditating where you get into some sort of a spiritual flow of some kind, I think is very useful for some people to then manifest yeah. things. Cause at least you feel you're not acting from a space of reacting and like panic and like, I've got to make yeah. it. And a lot of that energy is in LA, by the way. Oh my gosh. I, I used to love LA, but at the moment, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure I'm confused. I always wanted to go to LA, but LA at the moment is a bit intense. Uh, <laughs> I think post COVID yeah. LA yeah, switched around. It's, okay. it's intense. I know a lot of people left and it's like, there's this desperation in the air. Mm. And I think getting out of that desperate, that space of desperation and yeah. getting into a space of creation is Absolutely. kind of what that flow that you're talking about. Um, so we don't actually talk about that specifically at MIU at the David Lynch MFA, but we talk about meditation. And the other thing they talk about here is a thing called, um, consciousness-based education where you focus on the individual before you do yeah. the teaching so it's it's also about self-growth and about living a life that is healthy and in tune with just your own needs so you so you don't struggle as much which is also important yeah. you know yeah that's so so fresh it's like there's no university that does that which no. makes it almost no. seems weird but like it's actually yeah, totally good. exactly it's really cool thinking and it's so much what people need to just take care yeah. of the self you know? yeah um, yeah it is and i thought it's just, just interesting because like as you say you know like when you when you put yourself in that in that um in that place where you're writing something that a memory like that happened in your life you're really getting those emotions yeah Not those emotions but like it's an energy right mm-hmm. um like uh, like absolutely 100 percent. it's just something different like as you say the words the scene the vibe everything comes alive mm-hmm. and it's completely fresh mm-hmm. and yep. i think that is just so super super exciting like not a lot yeah. of people think like that like when they write and i know that this is a mistake that i've made as well when 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 writing it's like um sometimes dialogue will come out really flat because you're just mm-hmm. you're just trying to say something and, and get it out there almost like in your first draft yeah you have yeah a marker of what you want to yeah. say yeah but it doesn't come out exactly how no. it doesn't come out exactly like how how, how you imagine it and then you go back yeah. and you're like i can't believe i wrote it like that it's so <laughs> and it's like 
you know, yeah. it's so bizarre. But the best part is is like is taking that and almost reinterpreting it in a way that is maybe blending it with your memories somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Or creating it. Well, memory. what you Yes, exactly. That's it. You create a memory for your characters because your characters in that moment, in that scene, are living it as if it's real, as if it's a memory that yeah. they will have one day. So they will be able to look back at your scene that you've created as a character and actually feel that they're in that memory. And as much mm -hmm. as when you look back in your life and you can think back and you can activate all your senses, sight, sound, touch, taste, smell, are all alive, you're in the moment, you're in that memory, it's real, it feels 100% real. You do that for your own story. And you go back and you you create memories for your characters by writing the scene. If you can create a scene that feels like a memory for a character, you know, wow, you've already doing it well. But of course, I agree with you as well. It's like when you do your first draft, sometimes you just go, I have no idea what's going on. I just know they're in this room and I know this has to happen. I don't know this has to happen. And they're going to say these lines and it's terrible. And the dialogue sounds so wooden and on the nose and, and flat. Yeah. But uh, I'm going to put it in now. <laughs> Move on to the next scene because yeah, I really want to write that one. <laughs> in because you want to get done, right? Yeah. And then you come back to yeah. It like, yeah, I realize how much that sucks. <laughs> well, you know, this is also um, where acting is is so important and i also think one of the reasons sylvester stallone uh could write rocky so well is because he mm -hmm. was an actor not saying that actors can write often they can't <laughs> it's very true <laughs> but sometimes um He's if you're an actor scripts. sorry yeah he'd read a lot of scripts but i think yeah. if you're an actor and you write uh, or if you they actors can imagine themselves into scenes in a way that some writers are afraid of doing and mm -hmm. so there's something about activating your actor's brain when writing wow. and putting yourself in the scene imagining yourself like an actor would some I mean, some writers will walk around and act, act out the scene you know it's yeah. like yeah that's so i really uh, that's 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 really why i love writing scripts is because you're so immersed in it yourself it's like the world yeah. disappears and you're creating a world that you're a part of and that yeah. you can even you feel like you could be all of those characters that you're Absolutely. describing yeah. <laughs> like in a, in a yeah. weird way they're kind of different parts of you maybe they were you in the past or maybe mm -hmm. they're how you want mm -hmm. to be or maybe yeah um, you know then Definitely. of course there's there's tropes you know there's those those classic tropes that you um that you incorporate so tropes are super useful as well but the thing is i mean you never want to sort of bring in like just a just a boring square super stereotypical trope right like it's yeah. you can't you can't you can't just put like that into the script it has to no. be something that you've um that you've made your own like you've Maybe yeah, you could even subvert yeah. a trope that is like um absolutely you know, maybe this is like sort of for example, classic jock <laughs> and yeah. you change him into a quiet jock or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. So I think there are tropes and I think that the um this is again in my book, the external source as well is where the tropes come from, because you've seen all these movies, you've seen jocks represented in a certain way. So when you say jock, we all see them or, you know, trailer trash person, there's a certain thing that comes to mind. Uh mm -hmm. but taking from your memory well and then like from your memories and colliding them together so that you create unique characters is that's really powerful. That's super cool. Yeah. If you can. That. And then you think to your life, you're like, yeah, there was this jock at school, but there was something about him that was like super weird. Um, maybe he was, a, I don't know, you know, <laughs> I'm the, I always think of comedy. So I'm like, he's a professional walker. You know, there's people who walk really weirdly. That's his job. It's like <laughs> a professional jock walker as a comedy. <laughs> so now it's a comedy. But if you wanted to turn it into something that was more of a drama, you could try and think of, um, even in your own life, if you if you feel as like when when do I feel like really jockey? And what what am I suppressing? What's happening in my life in that moment? And then you try and and make your character more complex, where 
is it look the, it's kind of such a cliche even the jock is a cliche because the jock's always got the bullying father in the movies right the bullying father who then you know you see a scene in the moment in the movie where the guy who's being bullied sees his bully being bullied by his father and then suddenly cares about him like this is a this is a trope it's already fantastic. but it's, a, it's so, it's so just always the mean father right yeah like, exactly oh, always uh, and I mean, it's also something that people can recognize. So um, in a way, that's kind of what, what people want. But they also... Um, they do want that, I think. They do it's the want same, that. but different. They, <laughs> the same, but different, right? Like they want that, yeah. but they want it in like a new setting. Yeah. With like a setting that they're completely unfamiliar with. A totally fresh, different sort of culture. And mm -hmm. of course, like updated cultural norms, like yeah, yeah, um, which in essence kind of makes screenwriting sound over simply over simple. It's not, but um, I know that. I mean, you can go back to those old ancient stories of um, Norse gods, mm -hmm. yeah, and you can compare it to modern stories, and you can be like, oh, that's remarkably similar. You know, the character yeah. tropes in those ancient mm -hmm. stories and yes. they always pull through into modern stories like yeah absolutely it's always the hero's journey right it's like um yeah and there might be many heroes as well they, they could be like yeah. uh yeah. the sort of underdog hero story as well like the sub uh, subplot kind of thing going on um yeah yeah there's so many different things that make a screen that make a screenplay good um so how much of this is is like would you say, is this general right? Like, if you, no, okay. I'm just going to, I'm just going to leave that question. It was a random, it was a half a question. Um, was it like screenwriting compared to normal writing? Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking. Um, because, I mean, I've just, as a new screenwriter, I was wondering, you know, it's interesting how this kind of can be used in normal writing as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think this is the, a lot of what we've been talking about can be applied to any kind of writing. Um, the three wells of screenwriting is, I was going to call it the three wells of creativity because it's actually about any kind of creativity. You know, if you write yeah. a novel, you can draw from your memories. Um, if you even do a painting, you can draw from your memories um, mm -hmm. or imagination or other paintings that have come before it. So that framework is applicable to any kind of format. Um, but screenwriting is a very unique animal um very different because and it is unique because you're not just writing to a reader um you're writing a document that is supposed to be something that you can pitch it's a it's a sales document so essentially a script is a is a selling document <laughs> it's also a practical uh, blueprint on how to make the vision that's in your head for a um, whole lot of team of people so that's where screen screenwriting is different i think so the overall things can be applied to anything but the specifics of screenwriting is a it's a very unique thing yeah. i feel if i'm writing a, i've written some short stories like short short story i like super short stories uh, i've written some of those and you know you're writing directly to the reader whereas in a screenplay you're writing to a whole lot of different people and it's a your mindset is very different yeah so yeah. but I mean, overall I... the thing is the same yeah, I get you. Yeah. Um, have you ever had a moment where you've been like, uh, like there's something else, there's some, there's there's something else at play here. The reason why you, you know, the big purpose in your journey as a screenwriter, like, you know, what is it? What is that? What is your your purpose? Your 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 calling as a screenwriter how does that how did that sort of come about to you where you felt like i have to do this because is it meaningful in some way to you that you're contributing to the world in some way yeah. like um <laughs> or is it is it you know for me as a writer like i just want to reach millions of people with my amazing prose <laughs> like <laughs> I, I always thought since i was like 13 years old i just want to like I want to talk to millions of people. I want them to read what I'm writing and be like, oh, amazing. You know, that's, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what, that's, that's what my, you know, my, 
my driving force was in the beginning. Mm. And I think that's, mm. that's still part of it. But also now it's kind of like, um, it's sort of, it's changed into, um, it's also very much for me a way to help people because mm -hmm. it's, you can bring in themes in a story that will really influence people for the rest of their lives. Um, yeah. And in so many ways we are influencing, we're being influenced by the television we watch, by the movies we oh, watch. Oh yeah, hugely. And it tells us what's okay. It tells us what's not yeah. okay. It tells us what's possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I think that's such a huge responsibility um, that mm -hmm. you convey good message, right? Do you? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. What's it's like, a great if you were to, yeah okay sometimes to think about it it's a big question and i just no no I, on you. <laughs> it's okay i i i think that the the reason it changes through time so i think um it's interesting that you say this you know if we go back to my 13 year old self going to the um headmaster saying that i want to be a film director yeah. In retrospect, I realized that was me trying to get my father's attention because he loved movies and he wanted to be a filmmaker and he kind of was going to be a cinematographer, but he kind of sacrificed his, I think in his mind, he kind of sacrificed his life a bit to support for the family and he worked in a camera store, but he had this love for movies and he used to have like Sight and Sound magazines, which is this film making magazine, which I love, um, he used to have those around. And I think a hundred when I wanted to be a film director, it was to make daddy proud. <laughs> that was the because weird, that was the life weird. That they wanted to live and you want to do it so well because then, you, then they'll be proud of you. Yeah. But, okay, so that as a driving force though is a bit of a false driving, um, for me anyway, looking at my life as a, as a drive to create was actually can lead to you to end up making stuff that you don't really want to make. So for example, mm -hmm. I have a story that I was going to make called the first route of survival. It's one of the first scripts that I wrote, maybe the second feature film script. And it was a slasher horror story about students on their way mm -hmm. to the a, a rave in the desert that take a wrong turn. They get hacked to death by a pickaxe wielding apartheid experiment gone wrong on these two genetically modified dogs. And it was a, a crazy story, which would result in fear in the world. Yeah. And I didn't know at the time, I was just writing it because I was like, yeah, I want to direct, I want to direct. I remember, yeah. and, and the times when I've shown stuff on the screen that I've made um, and people clap, I like mm. disappear. It's because I'm getting the affirmation that I always wanted as a kid. And wow. that can that. lead you, but the problem with it is that it can lead you into doing stuff that you end up making movies that you don't really want to make because you're looking for this acclaim you're looking for the millions of people wow. you're looking for the applause and the awards and i ended up so almost cute. making a movie that was going to make people scared to go into nature <laughs> that was the outcome of the movie is like wow. it would have made people wow. and 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 some of them the, the moments in this in the script were very like graphically violent and some of them were even misogynistic and there were a lot of mm -hmm. elements in that script that i'm glad it didn't get made the process where it fell apart was traumatic and very difficult because it almost did get made and it would have been my like debut as a as a filmmaker and a lot and of that would have been impact in the world it would have been my impact in the world but yeah it could have been the start of it and look a lot of people so like even um you know, there's a lot of people like um, the Godfather director, uh, Francis Coppola, he had his start in horror movies and then he ended up making movies that were maybe a lot more interesting and complex. Um, so that was my thinking at the time. But I, I know that I was driven by something at that time that was not um, authentic. Um, and so it is interesting, but at the same time, if you go to therapy and fix all your problems up, <laughs> you might never make anything <laughs> so it's this delicate balance between yeah. checking where the drive is coming from because the responsibility and i do think actually this is a much broader topic but i do think that there's a responsibility in the filmmakers to create something that um I, it's complicated this thing about because as soon as you start going down the, the the realm of being a responsible filmmaker it can lead to censorship and i am totally against censorship i'm all for free speech um but right. for example if you create a movie where the end is that the most powerful person who fights the best wins 
you get the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which I love, by the way, I'm you know, totally into it. Yeah. But essentially, that, yeah. that whole world is might makes right. And might makes right is what the colonialist powers have always said, is that the strongest will win. Now, if you look at Rocky, it's interesting to go back to Rocky, because, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the film, maybe I shouldn't say, but whatever, mm -hmm. <laughs> we kind of know. No worries. Rocky, go ahead. He, doesn't win the, he doesn't win the fight in the end. People forget yeah. this. They think Rocky wins the yeah, fight. Exactly. He doesn't. Yeah. He survives the rounds. He takes mm -hmm. the punches. He gets the respect from the crowd and he gets admiration. He, his name is said out loud. And he also learns to respect himself enough that he can say publicly to Adrian that he, he loves her and she loves him and they mm -hmm. kiss. And so the ending of Rocky is, is interesting. And I think one of the reasons it stays so powerful in the psyche of the world is because it's not actually saying I'm the strongest boxer who fights better than you. It's saying something a lot more complicated. And yeah. I think as, as writers and creators, we do have a responsibility to be careful with what we put out there. Um, I think sometimes filmmakers who just want to do stuff that's cool and looks great. I've seen students make, cause I've, I also taught directing and editing for some many years at AFDA and UCT and yeah. City Varsity all over the place. And I've seen students who really want to make a movie that is about um, domestic violence or something. And then they, they cut together a scene and the guys beating up mm -hmm. the woman, but they put, the, they put this music in this like heavy metal music. And it looks, it looks almost like it's celebrating violence as opposed to um, right. saying that it's a bad thing. And so anyway, my overall point is w it, the medium that we're wielding with filmmaking mm -hmm. has, it, it, it's, it's, it's imp it's imprecise. It's precise in some ways, but it's also imprecise. And I always think to myself, and this is where I'll try and end this, is if I'm putting a film on the screen, chances are, and this is terrible to go here, but I'm going to go here anyway because it's just really real, chances are that there are abusers and rapists in the audience. What are they going to, how are they going to respond to what they're seeing on the screen? And I have a responsibility to try and, for me, change the world into a place that is more inclusive and more and a better, more positive world. And therefore, the stuff that I create, I think we need to be sensitive to what we create. So that's <laughs> because the stuff we put out there and, and, and we consume just now, we just consume, you know, I, Netflix, we just, and so I think there is a responsibility there. Definitely. I mean, it's so, it's such a sensitive thing. A lot of people out there are suffering with horrendous trauma from things that have happened to them, stuff that people don't normally want to think about because it's that horrible, right? So yeah. when when people make like really hectic stuff, you kind of wonder if they'd ever experienced yeah. true trauma, would they make that kind of thing? Yeah. Because yeah. going back there is something so terrifying that people that have yeah. been through that trauma actually avoid that kind of thing completely because it's so triggering exactly yeah um, yeah and <laughs> i think that's what's difficult to explain to people when they're like, oh i love horror you know and i get it like, horror is like a vibe yeah. it's i get it i get it yeah yeah, it. yeah but at the same time i mean i have some trauma in my childhood that i, I will never ever go back to i will never watch yeah. a horror movie <laughs> that's just, yeah well there is there is um it's a very interesting topic this um we could talk about it forever but um so David Lynch, uh, who I teach, I also teach his works. Uh, he goes to very, very dark places. I can't even watch some of the movies because they are really terrifying, like um, yeah. and and very disturbing. Um, he tries to go there in a, in a different way, I think, to some other filmmakers. But um, but it is complicated when things are so triggery for you. And there's this there's this notion. Um, it's re I'll, I'll briefly touch on it, but it is interesting. Is that um, in the 90s and even early 2000s, there's this notion that the audience is um, numb and we have to shock them into changing. And so we show them violent images. We show them the most disturbing things because we have to shock the audience. But there is this new notion, newish notion of a um, avant-garde of caring for the audience and knowing that the audience is traumatized and therefore creating works, knowing that with that in mind, um, almost like a, a caring avant-garde, 
which is an, an interesting notion. Um, again, when I say all of this, I have to just say it can't be censorship. I, it, I just can't be censorship. If you want to show the yeah. violent stuff, you do you, you do you, you do that stuff. If you want to, if you get your kicks, you can get your kicks from watching violent stuff, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But um, I do think be aware of the impact. Um, and I, I, I see filmmakers, and I'll, I'll probably get. Um, People will stop watching this video now if I say this, but I do see filmmakers like Tarantino, who I don't think is a very conscious filmmaker, actually. I think he sometimes has, he seems to be very interested in revenge and um, mm -hmm. almost. Oh, uh, yeah, a lot of people say that. Um, he's it, like it, it, such a, he's such anyway, a but, but at the same time, it's, uh, it, <laughs> one might end up feeling quite desensitized after watching like a, a whole bunch of Tarantino movies. That's, I mean, so it feels like for me a lot of the time it's from resentment, but that's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I anyway, mean, but, 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 you know, that as well. they're still great films and it's really fun. And sometimes films are just films. Yeah. They're just on the screen and you enjoy them. That's I the other thing. Is... I was, uh, I worked in a newsroom for three years. It was a journalist and something that, I can say with complete certainty is that what I know about news is that it, what sells is the most violent images and the most violent yeah. horrific yeah. stories. That's yeah. it's terrible, but news is never good news, right? Yeah, it's not like they're going like I know. Let's find all the charming, happy, wonderful stories, yeah. and we'll just like make it front page. You know? Yeah. Like, There's that if saying: if it bleeds, it bleeds. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. If it, that was a freaking sticker up in the newsroom if it bleeds it bleeds and i mean the one time on the weekend it was a slow weekend and um wow. slow news weekend we were looking for stories and something came up i think it was a bum i think mm. it was a boko haram killing or something like a car bomb or something and there were like four people died oh my gosh and somebody assessed the situation they were like you know this is ongoing this kind of thing is just constantly happening and it was only like four people so it's not wow. a lead maybe put it like lower down but yeah the lead yeah will exactly be like 10 people nine ten <laughs> nine ten more than oh a God. pile of bodies basically <laughs> and so like uh, I, I don't oh know gosh. no offense to anybody in that in the news industry love you guys doing good job and all that jazz but i know that i definitely I'm too sensitive for that environment. Mm. And it takes a tough person to be able to uncover really horrible stories and they're doing a good oh, job yeah. and that's good. But I have to say at the same time that there's something very problematic about that because I don't want to go into politics right now, but I know that everybody that works in the newsroom must see a therapist because you become so desensitized that you make jokes mm. about the darkest things. It's mm. like hilarious, mm. you know, but it's not, it's absolutely, it's like a part of you just sort of um, wraps yourself around this awful thing and accepts it as part of yeah. your reality. And you kind of end up making these having dark sense of humor. And if you, if you're, if you're making movies that are super dark, um, well, I mean, it's almost like you're making fun of it because you don't want to see the reality that that has actually happened. Yeah, I just want to say thank you so much for all your tips and, and not only sure. tips, but your insight and your experience and your wisdom. And I'm super excited to see your stuff produced like uh, in <laughs> on the big screen, like in Hollywood yeah. vibes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, like already you're, you're quite well known in South African, um, industry and, um, and I suppose, um, whoever wants to check you out, just go and Google Matthew, Kal is it Kalil or yeah. Kalil? No? Kalil, yeah, you can say it anyway, but it's K-A-L-I-L. -L, yeah. And you can Google me, there's stuff out there. <laughs> there's videos yeah. and things, <laughs> surprisingly. <Matthew. laughs> There's also an NFL quarterback okay. called, you know, it used to just be me. And then this NFL quarterback, Matthew Khalil, started like coming up. And I was like, dude, who are you? Anyway, are you? It's, it's like really funny. <laughs> we have the same name. And so it's either me or the NFL quarterback. But he's actually not a quarterback. I'm lying. He's a, he's a something else. But he's not a yeah. quarterback. So tell oh, me, goodness. what is your, what's, the, what's in the pipeline for you? What, what projects? I and mean, if you can tell, if you can tell me. But what's your plan? Yeah. Like, what, what can we look out for 
That's a really great question. Um, I want to make a movie here while I'm here, at least something in, in America, because I've never actually shot anything here. So even if I make a short or something, I really want to try and do that while I'm here. I might make some documentaries. Um, I'm in this really weird small town, and uh, there's so many characters here that I'm kind of interested in looking at them mm. and doing a little, like, uh, I guess an observational documentary about all these people that I'm seeing all the time because it is so weird and so mm. unique. Um, but I've also written an adaptation of a South African novel that I would love to get made. But again, it's this question you ask is like from having it now done to getting it made, how? I don't know. It's this abyss. We face it all the time as screenwriters. It feels like an abyss between the thing that I have and where it is going to be. And so mm -hmm. it's just facing that abyss every day. Uh, and trying to get it out there and write to producers. And then, you know, you wake up in the morning and you're like, hmm, okay, I've got to get this thing out. Who can I write to? Oh, I'll just watch something on TV. <laughs> or I'll just, make it, I'll just make a cup of tea or, you know, oh, I've got to go and take out the trash. This is very important. Uh, and then eventually that abyss just keeps staying there, you know. So put it this way. If things line up and... Uh, and the right connections are made and the script gets seen at the right time at the right place, then maybe you'll see some work from me. But it is a little bit of that alchemy. And uh, actually Chris Vogler, who I spoke about right in the beginning, he speaks about how, because he's worked with a lot of really amazing people in LA. And he says he doesn't know how it works at all, but some people get plucked. He talks about how, like get plucked up by this unknown force and suddenly they're famous and suddenly right. their work gets done and suddenly they're making movies and he says he doesn't know what it is because everybody's maybe like sort of talented to a certain extent and some people just get plucked so if i get plucked maybe you'll see more of my work if i don't get plucked i'll just still be here writing stuff and just being me i'm, I'm sure you're gonna get plucked you're gonna get plucked. <laughs> Um, you're running out of like, plucking time chair, and then you're gonna be like boom in the director's chair <laughs> i have this and hilarious <laughs> i have this like, hilarious oh, i know it's really funny i have this hilarious uh story that i'll share real quick because it's just it just shows the humanity of like wanting to yeah. direct i always think like one day i'll be walking along and i'll be walking past a set <laughs> And the director will like die, and someone will go, "Hey, anybody here? Can can anyone direct?" <laughs> and That's I'll go, brilliant. Brilliant. "Bring me in, that. I'll direct." <laughs> it's like, Seriously, that's like, oh my gosh, that's hilarious. Uh, so if that oh happens, gosh, then, well, then we can stop the recording and then talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm, th I'm gonna uh, thank thank you so much. Um, uh, I, I really, really appreciate you being on this podcast. It's been very enlightening and I have, well, I don't know. I'm no guru, but, um, <laughs> well, kind of, I am no, um, um, but I really do believe that you will, you'll, you're going to be a big deal. You really are. A big, you are a big deal. I am a big deal. You're a you, big so deal, you. Matthew. <laughs> okay. I know. Thank you so much for cool. being on the show. Alrighty. And, um, Thanks. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Keep writing.